Gracias. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. I introduce you that way every single podcast episode, the well, wonderful Bob Cook. It's a good job I haven't got much narcissism. So, uh, <laughs> um, so this, this, the title of this week's episode is Working with a Depressed Client. Yes, yes. If you go to Google and put in the word depression you'll get lots and lots and lots of sites and in fact i looked up the most common mental health words put into google is depression yeah it's it's interesting now eating disorders anxiety panic attacks whatever you like but depression is the number one word in other words that's been used the most which i didn't realize i thought anxiety might be but no depression is and certainly, Do you think it's the word that people band around an awful lot now. If they're just having a low mood, that they use the term depression. Well, I think depression is um, on a continuum. Yeah. Between what you might just call their low mood um, to, uh, you know, with the people who've got quite a sense of groundedness and they may feel down at that sense, but they're still able to contact themselves in the here and now and take ownership of the mood and perhaps it'll pass to the other end of the continuum which is right at the other end is more sort of uh, uh, psychosis you know or intense depression which will stay around and people incapacitate themselves and impairs functioning yeah so that's that level. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, right. To what you just said there, the other side of the continuum, which we could call working with the worried well or working with low mood. It's when people have enough adult or here and now functioning abilities to get out of that position quite quickly because they've got a sense of being groundedness all the way up to the um, extreme end of depression, which is really where they may stay in bed for a whole day. Yeah, yeah. And it impacts on the working life and the social life and family life and everything. Yeah, yeah. So you are correct. People might use the word depression when they when they may, may mean low mood and feeling down. If I think of the number of clients over the last 38 years that might have come into my practice to talk about depression, more of them, it's more towards the middle of that continuum where it's more than just low mood. It's more, I want to say it's intense depression where you've got, you know, psychosis, but certainly where the functioning is impaired. Yeah. Uh, so I see, I suppose, people more, or I did, in the middle of that continuum. Yeah. What are your thoughts on antidepressants and therapy? Well, you know, you could get a thousand therapists and I suppose they might say, say different things. Um, but I see medication very much as a functional tool. In other words, that they help people function. And I don't see anything wrong with that. I, I'm not a therapist that you know, says before they take people on for treatment that, that they have to be off depression. And I mean, uh, tablets completely because it, it, it can affect the, the, the mood swings. I, I, I will work with people if they're using tablets for a functional reason so that they then can look at the depression or they can actually uh, function. So I see it in that, that sort of level. The problem is, of course, with medication in my head is that um, the body gets used to it, so the actual the, the intense amount of milligrams will go up. So if you start on 40 degrees, 40 degrees, I mean, 40 milligrams of medication might, you know, go up to 100 and 100. And before you know where you are, you're 150 or something, the side effects then become more intense. So uh, the important thing is to, whether you're taking medication or not, is to look at 
drives the actual depression. Um, but if they're so incapacitated, then I'm okay with them, you know, being on medication so they can function so we can get to perhaps what's underneath it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what I say to clients. I'm not pro-medication and I'm not anti-medication, but sometimes it can just quieten things down enough so that therapy, you know, is, like you said, that it's accessible. They can be more in the here and now and, you know, get something from the therapy. Mm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, some therapists, of course, ask their, well, they don't take clients on uh, with medication because they would argue that it's, uh, more challenging to do psychotherapy when somebody's under the uh, under medication. So depends where you come from, but I see medication more functional. Yeah, yeah, and you you know the the other thing that people sometimes talk to me about is that you know getting off the medication they kind of think that it's the medication that's helping them and as soon as they come off the medication they're going to take a, a massive back step and go back to where they are that's that's a lot of people's fear around medication the most important thing with medication is to come off very slowly yeah with the help of a professional uh, a doctor or a mental health professional where they can have a supportive program to come off the medication you know um, and it may take three to six months to come off it yeah and then they need to have support I think to work at what was originally driving the depression in the first place now I think with depression it's never just one thing no I was just going to say that's that's kind of like I don't know trying to catch water to work out what it was that started the road of depression yeah i mean some actually i never say i suppose 100 percent at a psychological level so there might be some occasions where the, the person's um has such a traumatic experience that leads to psychological processes uh and then leads to depression but usually it's quite a few things yeah that drives the depression yeah because sometimes i see it as kind of like the body resetting itself could you say a little bit more about that well some <coughs> people are, are really fearful of depression whereas you know maybe one way of looking at it is that it's it's the body just saying it needs time out you, you know to it's different for everybody like you say on that spectrum and whereabouts they are on that spectrum oh. well yeah on the on the lighter side of that spectrum um i can see the way you're thinking with that the, it's it's almost like what you're saying it's the um person's process about withdrawal to cut off from you know the hecticness of the day or yeah. the, the day to cut off which then they might call depression yeah mm. on that side of the continuum as you go along though uh, into the more intense levels of depression where functioning is impaired to a to a high degree i think that, that is driven in an from a different process altogether okay say more what what well, if you're talking about psychotherapy of depression, especially uh, uh, at a more intense level, then there's certain things that need to happen. Happen, um, you know, and it's not about simply looking at coping strategies. Now, coping strategies are fine. I mean, it's really important to talk about coping strategies. That's how people survived. You know, whether, whether it's whether they go walking for five miles, five miles every day, whether it's they go to the gym. And intensely work out whether they use ex exercise whether they use mindfulness whatever coping mechanisms i mean it's important to talk about those things however you know if we, if that if it still persists we need to go to a deeper level so we need to really do a um what i'm calling an analysis and talk about what's been happening in their past 
you know, a little bit more about what's been happening under the surface so they can feel understood. So in other words, the first step really is to listen to their story yeah. of how they uh, reflect on the causes and the uh, drives, if you like, behind the depression. And nine times out of 10, they will go back to certain times in their history. Yeah. Often, they probably go back to adolescence and talk about teenage years. They may go to, uh, you know, later times in their life when they've had traumas, when they've had loss, when they've been sexually assaulted or whatever it is. Uh, they may start there, but they often then will go back. And it's very important for the therapist to give the opportunity for the person to talk out what they've often been suppressing for a long time. Because it's the material that's been suppressed that is part of the problem. Okay. Does that make, is that clear to you? Is yeah, that yeah. That's yeah. why I suppose therapy is often called a talking therapy rather than say a physical therapy, for example. Yeah. Because you need to talk out. It's a bit like, have you ever picked up a honeycomb? Not picked one up, no, seen one. No, you know what it is, it has lots of compartments in it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, when we're talking about depression at the level we're talking about on the right side of the continuum, what an intense depression which interferes with functioning it's usually linked to trauma, yeah? And what happens is the people in their early history, when they've been traumatized or shocked or something has happened in their history which has been particularly harmful, they, they move to what I call a compartmentalized system. And they put that trauma into that compartment. So we yeah. all about a honeycomb, put that, yeah. they close the door. Yeah. But it takes such a lot of energy to keep the door shut. They then feel depressed because they're using up a lot of energy to actually keep that door shut. The part of the therapy of depression is to actually help the person talk about their history, their traumas, their life. So we might, might over time, uh, with the client's you know, willingness, of course, open that little door, that door a little bit to start dealing with the trauma, which could be driving the depression. Yeah. So first step is to help them understand their story and to, to talk with the therapist so they feel unstabbed plus for the first time. Second is to talk about the belief systems and the decisions they've made yeah, uh, in response to other people in the world as they've been growing up in life and to see if those um, belief systems are actually part of the problem with the depression. So if they are, if they made a decision the world's not to be trusted and I'm a particularly nasty person, then most people will get depressed with those belief systems going on and on and on and on and on and on all the time. And if they've got a highly critical narrative which is bearing down on them it's not surprising that people feel down yeah you know, it's not rocket science but the therapist needs to get to or enable the client to discover that critical narrative which is often um well it's led by decisions they make about themselves which come from elsewhere So would you say when when would depression start as in age wise is that something that teenagers suffer from is that kind of no i picked on the teenagers because quite often people remember their teenage years and they often they often think of it as a time where there's a lot of peer pressure where their oppositional side um, is more energetic where there's been a lot of um, conflict with the parents around and they often find that time highly conflictual and a time where they can rem remember themselves feeling down. However, it, that doesn't mean all depression starts then at all. In fact, 
you know, you know, we can go right back. I mean, there's no such thing as a depressed baby. I've never seen a baby being depressed, by the way. I've done quite a bit of infant observation. So it's not, we're not talking about somebody, you know, a baby being born and you're depressed. It's not like that. So things can be happening, of course, where, where a baby, a young toddler will close down. So for example, if, if you're born into the world to a depressed mother and father, or particularly a depressed mother, and a depressed mother might be someone who's shut down part of themselves. Yeah. But actually, they aren't able to spontaneously interact with the baby. Then the baby themselves might shut down. So if you're born into a depressed family, you could work, you could, and you usually do, um, take on that depression in some way. Yeah. So it's not about, you know, at a certain age, somebody six, seven, eight, nine, fifteen, nineteen, or whatever age you want to pick out of the air. You know, there's there's, there's many developmental ages where people will shut down, withdraw, and cut off part of themselves and feel down. Yeah. Now, according to the level of trauma around that, will be how severe the withdrawal is. So let me give you an example of somebody uh, who came into my office and I do a lot of the assessments and pass them on to other therapists. And she came in and she said, I've come for my doctor to try some therapy. Um, this is my last chance. I've never had therapy before, but I'm going to try it out because I hear that it might be useful for me. So when somebody comes in to, um, for assessment like that, my first step besides hearing the story is to find a little bit about what happened in their history and how the past might affect the present. Yeah. So when I started to explore very straightforwardly, like, you know, tell me a bit about is your mum alive? Is your dad alive? And, you know, that sort of thing. She said, yes, my mother's alive and my father's dead. And as we went explored a bit more, she, she shared that her mother had been depressed all her life. Now, as she said that, and I said, I said, gosh, she suddenly said, she started to make connections in her head, really about, you know, Jackie, Whose depression is it? Yeah, that's an interesting and, and, thought. Yeah. yeah. And then when I said, oh, that's interesting. She said, oh, what's interesting? And I said, well, I exactly what I'm saying to you, Jackie. I wonder whose depression it is. You know, you've been depressed for 20 years. I wonder if really the origin of your depression isn't in yourself, but comes from somewhere else. And she suddenly stood up and said, yes, that's what it is. I've taken on my mother's depression, haven't I? And I said, well, we certainly be good to explore that because the important thing is then, if you come to that place, then you can give it back to her and you can be free of this depression and live in a way which is more spontaneously to yourself and more healthy. So I sent her off to a therapist and I bumped into her about six months later and she said to me, Bob, she said, I want to tell you, I've given the depression back to my mother and I'm much happier. Oh, bless. Lighter. And I feel like my life can start again. So it's, it's really important, this concept, that a lot of what people report as depression isn't their own depression. It's either, it's, it's either been one modeled down to them as a way of solving problems. So that's what they take on. Or they actually do psychologically take on the depression of the people around them, the significant people around them. So one really part of the treatment of somebody who's depressed is for them to take charge of the depression. Now, in this case, she took charge of it and gave it back to her mother. And once she did it, she didn't have the depression anymore. For people listening to this, that might seem like a very easy solution to depression well i think 
it's not easy because she'd been uh, going to doctors for 15 years. She'd been on Prozac for 18 years. She'd done a lot of things that the doctor had said. She'd been on medication for 10 years. And it wasn't until she did a talk in therapy that she started to realize that actually it wasn't her depression, but it took her a long time to get to that point. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, sometimes it is just looking at things from a different perspective or a different point of view. Yeah, that, yeah. that one thing can yeah. change everything. That's what I mean by yeah, yeah. the people listening might think that was a really easy solution. But we oh, get attached yeah. to a way of being. It becomes part of our story that I'm this person or that person. This is just how I react to everything. When the reality is, that's not who we are. It's it's a story that we've built up around. Mm, that's right. And so it's actually really important that the therapist takes some time, which is where I started with this, understanding the story of the person who's coming to the room. Now, of course, yeah. if they come from a place, which I hope most therapists do come from, is that the past affects the present, then it's through an exploration of the past that we can get to these new perspectives. Yeah. So you are right. It's how we get to them, though. Yeah. I, right, again, I wouldn't want the listeners to just think, oh, we wake up one morning, go to the therapist, and suddenly we get that new perspective. It doesn't quite work like that. You have to be, A, at the right time to hear it anyway, and B, the therapist needs to have a certain way of thinking, which is I, which is I, well, I, the way I believe, anyway, is that the past affects the present. Once you've come from that place, we can then start thinking, oh, why? How does the past affect the present? And and the most important question is, whose depression is it? Yeah. Now, if we look at depression, if we look at the medical, you know, classification around depression. They usually talk about two different types of depression. One is reactive depression and one is indigenous depression. And reactive depression is what it says, is reacting to the circumstances around you, uh, developmentally or in present day. Indigenous depression is that you were born with it. Now, I see no evidence, by the way, of a depressive genetic gene. So... You know, I know there's, there's plenty of research that's gone and depends what research you read. But in my um, readings, that I, I, in my clinical practice, I've never seen a uh, depressed baby. So I don't come from that place of looking and thinking about depression being genetic. So I, did, I think about um, depression in terms of a reactive depression and decisions uh, the person has made developmentally in response to what's happening around them or or they've taken on the depression as a way of solving problems or they've taken on the depression as a way of relieving the psychological burden from the significant other people and then they carry the depression for the rest of their lives unless somebody starts to put in new and new help them look at the whole process psychologically from a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, the indigenous one, the, the gene or genetics and you know having depressed babies and things. That's that's an interesting one. That's kind of nature nurture stuff. Well have you ever seen I know you've worked this area a lot. I know you've got children real I know you talk in this area in your, in your parenting process. Have you ever seen or any observed a baby uh, that's born depressed? Not born depressed, no. But I think yeah. from the moment we're born, we start to make certain decisions. You know, yeah, that doesn't mean it's genetic. It's been passed down or modelled to them. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. And it's like you get a baby that cries a lot and you get a baby that cries and nobody comes. So it learns to not cry anymore. They're not born that way, 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's what, I, what, I, what I'm dealing with. Uh, and so, so I see the psychotherapy treatment depression at the intense level about looking at how the past affects the present, all things I've just been talking about with you. At the more worried well section, I might just, I'll be looking not only at that, but I'll be looking at coping mechanisms and helping people build in things like mindfulness. 
helping people building things like going to the gym, um, eating well, um, all these sorts of things, and developing different, more healthy coping mechanisms. But even then, I will tend to look at how the past, where it has come from. Yeah. Do yeah, you think, think for, for some depression is a coping mechanism? It's a way of surviving all these things, yes. Yeah. All these psychological processes are a way of surviving um, in the world they live in. And we live in a very stressful world. And you started off the podcast in an interesting way, really, which is, you know, could we be in a position where um, as adults, it doesn't have to be, you know, with 10, 12, 15, whatever it is, we may want to switch off part of ourselves because the stimulus from the world is so demanding. Yeah. Is that called depression? Well, it may appear like that because somebody might um, incapacitate themselves or they may have problems in concentration or they may switch part of themselves off or they may appear listless or they might even have what is called you know, awakening depression where they wake up early in the morning. So it may appear like that. But it, is, it, is it at this level a conscious decision to shut down part of themselves because the stimulus from the world is so um, hectic? It's an interesting one, but it certainly lives in the area of the worried well. That, that, it doesn't live in the area of what I will call the intense depression. No. It's, I think, much more trauma-based. Yeah. And depression is often linked with other issues as well it, it you know it's sometimes it's seen as a side effect of of other things you know if like you say if there's a trauma or you know a grieving process then depression can also be part of something else yeah i i think psychotherapy treatment depression you have to look at the developmental history of the person in front of you and help them explore that because it may well be part of something else you're correct yeah now, um, depression in its, you know, in its simplest form is we depress part of ourselves energetically. In other words, we withdraw and cut part of ourselves off and we deprive ourselves of energy to actually spontaneously react to the world around us. So we will appear cut off, withdrawn, listless, yeah. passive, and um, lacking energy in general. Yeah. Now, we do those for reasons, and we could call them, you know, they're survival mechanisms, and then we cope in the best way we can to get by in life. And we may cope in a way which actually doesn't mean that we interact with the world much, but we sort of get by. Yeah. Yeah. And one, you know, some of the things that I say to clients is that, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, do, we're not depressed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There will be times within the day where our mood lifts, where we smile, somebody distracts us, we go out to work and come back and, you know, kind of pick it up and put it down. So it's, it's, it's not always an intense feeling 100% of the time. No, and again, you, you, you're going back to this continuum model. Yeah. So in the sort of like side, which I think is more lighter depression or change in mood or however you want to describe it, then I would agree with you on the, as we go up the continuum though, where we, we have more intense depressive episodes, they last longer. Yeah. Um, that, that these types of people will have narratives in their heads which are complete, which are 100% of the day telling themselves off. That they are people who um, have made decisions about themselves which are very, very negative. They exist on negative recognition and um, they find it hard to switch moods. And they will think of depression as something external to themselves. So the concept you just talked about is quite alien to them. And that is, they can see you're coming from a place that a person can cha take charge of the, let's put it in inverted commas, depression and change their mood. Mm, yeah, to, to a certain extent, but not that it's a conscious thing, that it, 
it happens anyway. Um, well, then now we're into the realms of unconsciousness and consciousness. Yeah, um, yeah, hundred percent. And I think if somebody smiles at you, I'll give you an example of something. In the cafe across the road, which you you probably weren't, I think, training before. I think that cafe had actually disappeared, but it was a it was a cafe I used to go in a lot. And on a Thursday, um, I realised that there was quite a lot of people just sitting there, rocking backwards and forwards, drinking their cups of tea, and actually they were depressed. And what they were depressed, they were people who would come in and they, they were waiting for their, their money from social services because next door above the cafe was, was where they used to go and sign off for the dole every Thursday. And the times that I sat down with some of these, we'll call them depressed, at the moment, depressed people with low energy and all things we're talking about here. When I walked away from them, I felt depressed myself. Yeah. Because if you ever sit with somebody who's depressed, you will probably feel bad about yourself when you walk away. Because part of the psychological process for somebody who's depressed is to project out to you their depression so they don't feel so bad. Does someone who's depressed think about that in that way? I think it's probably an unconscious process around projection they will do. So if somebody smiles with somebody who's depressed, I agree with you, they may smile better and they may have a shift of mood, I don't know. They may adapt socially and feel slightly better because they've had somebody who smiled at them in the day. So at one level, I think you're correct, but is it is it actually a decision I think I think see I think for somebody who's depressed they need to really understand that if they think of controlling that they can control the depression themselves rather than seeing it as an external process then they're able to move towards changing their mood if they always give up control to an external body which is a this dark depression that comes over them that they will always stay depressed interesting yeah so at one level i agree agree with you that that if you smile if you smile with people so for example you go like i've just said in that cafe and smile to somebody who's depressed they may or may not smile with that and who's to know that smile might mean they feel uh they have some relief from the internal critics in their head so they're able to lift their mood but do they think about it that way i doubt it I think it's like an unconscious phenomenon which if you talk to them they just say oh, I just felt better because June or Bob smiled at me but they don't I don't think they think about it in terms of taking ownership of the depression and as a psychotherapist I think the number one position is to help the person move to a place where they can think about the depression in terms of that they're in control of the depression and once they get to that place, then they don't have to stay with the depression anymore. Yeah, I get what you're saying about the external environment that causes or lifts it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so go back to that example I gave you. Once that person had realized that depression wasn't hers and she could take ownership of the depression and give it back to the external frame of reference, she felt a thousand times better. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it the, all the psychological stuff is very interesting, and it all depends which side of the fence you're sitting on and and your own belief system to a certain extent. Well, if you if you are a psychotherapist coming from a psychodynamic viewpoint like I do, that that means the past affects the present. Hundred percent. Yeah. Comes with depression, you will explore the past. Yeah. And by exploring the past, you will get to the belief systems that the person has about themselves and the others. And if you can help them change those belief systems and take responsibility for the depression, you can help the person uh, change their mood yeah yeah and the the only place really that you know a lot of us spend very little time in is in the present when you were saying about using mindfulness and things 
a lot of our suffering is either in the past or trying to predict the future. That's why when you start to help somebody understand these links and change these things, you need to then help them change their quite often destructive or put another way, unhealthy coping mechanisms, even though they pick those coping mechanisms to help them get by, understand that, but they usually out of date. So you need to help them do mindfulness, eat properly, go walk, do exercise, take time out. You need to help them integrate these new helping mechanisms because otherwise, you know, they'll just revert, revert back to what was unhealthy. Yeah. Mindfulness is a really good grounding exercise, I think, to help people take stock in this world. I love mindfulness. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And walking is another one. So these healthy, but the healthy coping mechanisms we we need to um, certainly encourage. However, until you get to what's driving the depression, it's only half the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it can be hard work if you're putting all the coping mechanisms in and not looking at what's underneath it and what's driving it. Then it's it's hard work because <laughs> you're just doing lots of stuff and not actually looking at the reasons why and where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why talking therapy and a therapist that thinks the way I've just said can help a person cure, in inverted commas, depression. Yeah. Wonderful. Is there anything else on depression that you wanted to say? No, except for that. Um, I really like anyone listening to this to think about uh, people who are depressed. They feel powerless. They feel passive. They feel lacking in self-esteem. They feel lacking in confidence. And they usually believe the depression is like a black shadow that comes over them. The therapist's duty is to help the client reverse that whole process. Yeah. So they can take control of this depression themselves and are part of the relational process and change yeah yeah and i think that's really important that they are part of the change like you said that it's you know it, it's not an external thing it doesn't just happen to them once they st take control of it oh. and and yeah i think that's really important so those are my last words on depression jackie yes definitely so it's about reversing the process. Yes, but they have to get to a place where they take responsibility and ownership of that. And they can only do that if they understand how the past has driven their internal processes. If, if there was a new client that came to you, would you be able to, you know, I'm not saying that you're a magician or anything, but can you tell physically whether somebody is depressed yes so if somebody oh I'll give you the, the way that they talk the way that they sit stand yes 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 yeah. yes, yes if somebody comes in and they are walking slowly in the door they have very low energy they appear uh lacking in energy they talk fairly slowly or they talk very flatly they are quite monotonous in tone. They um, sit down as if they have no energy and um, they talk negatively. That is the, that will be a picture to me of somebody who's depressed. Yeah. And when you, you were talking earlier on about sitting in that cafe, I think that that was where my mind was going when you said that you moved away from them feeling flat and depressed yourself. I think we've all been out on a work to do where there's been somebody yeah. that talks yeah. like that, that we actually feel I were yeah. mood flattening. <laughs> that's right. And they were and that's not that's not that's not sort of like um, a conscious decision by the other person. No. It's an unconscious uh, desire to get rid of those feelings. So they project it onto somebody else like osmosis. Yeah. Does, does rapport kind of come into that? You know, when we talk about getting rapport with a client and moving at the client's speed and things like that, does that come into it? Because I know, not talking about a depressed client, but 
if if there's an anxious client or somebody that's kind of in the hurry up driver I can feel myself speeding up to to match their pace yeah so you need to slow down but yeah anxiety in a minute if we're in depression somebody who's going to be withdrawn somebody who's lacking spontaneity somebody who's passive all the things i just described now i'm not saying as a therapist you go to that place yourself but you need to i believe slow down be quite uh, give the person a long time to explain things to reflect things to talk about how the past the fox the present so you slow down the therapy especially at the beginning to get some um, aspect of rapport, pacing, or whatever language you talk about here, it doesn't mean you go to a depressed place yourself. It means that energetically, there's some clinical thinking about matching them at an energetic level. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking the opposite, really. You, you know, whether they would pick up from the external energy that would bring them up. You know, would you switch up the therapy no. in the room to no. to do no. behavioral stuff no. rather than thinking no. stuff no okay i'll tell you why because often they will feel patronized okay they'll feel out of sync with you and they might and the worst is they might feel patronized and uh, and you'll just lose lose the relationship altogether okay there's a medium way. I'm not saying you go right to the side, but I'm not actually saying you, you match their hopeless position. Uh, I'm not saying that, but you find a way to come alongside them, not mainly in that depressed place, but certainly not the other place which you were talking about. Finding a way where you can at least give them the person in front of you time to explore their, their hopelessness, to explore their lack of self-esteem, to explore how they feel like they want to kill themselves every day or to explore, to have the space to do that. Uh, and, and the problem with going to the other place that you actually can destroy that space in a moment. Interesting. The worst thing you can do with somebody who's depressed is go what you said. I know where you were coming from that. So, because you see the other person on the end, other end of it a can feel patronised, and more than that, they can feel that the therapist just doesn't understand them. They don't understand how serious, how this is a life and death process. This isn't just to be frivolous with. So the therapist's attempt for a clinical process, which is why I think you were coming from, can be vastly misunderstood if you go to another place, in my opinion. Yeah interesting yes it's an interesting subject and it's something i could talk about. we should have a podcast one and two on it but i'm quite happy to stop here brilliant okie dokie until the next time bob thank you so much yeah thank you bye 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 you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.